Good evening and welcome to my How Healthy Are You weekly conference call. My name is Dr. Thomas Brewer. I'm a PhD chemist. And before we get started, I wanted just to mention that some of you may have received a newsletter from Ronald Schneider, the uh, owner and CEO of Enriching Gifts. And he was just telling everyone about updates to the company this year. And one of those updates is I am no longer fulfilling the internet orders for Enriching Gifts. I actually don't have time to do that and all the blood screening and consulting and traveling that uh, have really picked up in the past year, 2019. So uh, I still carry the Enriching Gifts product. I still support and recommend the Enriching Gifts product and sell the Enriching Gifts product. So uh, there's really no change for anyone that uh, is on this call. Okay, today I wanted to talk about clocks and timing cycles in our body and how important they are. So most of you have heard of this term that there's this circadian clock or circadian rhythm, and there's actually a part of the brain that uh, is attributed to this clock, meaning the body knows uh, timing cycles. It may not know that it's 115 outside, but it knows what should be done in conjunction with other parts of the body. It also turns out that in addition to this central circadian clock in the brain, there are peripheral clocks. So these are clocks really in every organ of our body, our heart, our liver, the entire digestive tract, um, the microbiome production in the intestines and colon, pretty much everything has a clock or a timing cycle. And these cycles, of course, are very important when they're all in sync. And when they are in sync, you have optimal health. So an example of getting your brain circadian clock out of sync with the other clocks, your heart, your liver, your digestive tract, is when we change time zones. So that's one way, and that's one reason some of us have a lot of health issues when we change time zones. But even changes in sunrise and, and that are abrupt, like daylight savings time, will affect some people more than others. And, and also when you go to bed and, and how much light there is when you go to bed and what kind of light there is when you wake up, it all starts these clock cycles. It, it starts the peripheral clock cycles because the link is how much light is getting into our eyes. So when there's a lot of out of cycle sinks between our circadian clock and these external peripheral clocks in our organs, you get premature aging, mood disorders, uh, such as you, you just feel bad and depression, uh, weight gain leading to obesity, and all the way up to the dreaded cancer disease um, as a, an initial cause of this, because what, in the end, your immune system weakens. So there's also a, a link between light exposure and when you decide to take in food. So this links the enzyme production in our liver and pancreas with the production of acids in our gastrointestinal system and the probiotic working in our gastrointestinal system. They're linked to light exposure and food intake. And one simple thing we can all do is not skip breakfast because what happens when we don't eat 
quickly after rising, and, and you'll hear some health conscious people and experts say you, you should eat something within 20 minutes or one hour or something like that, but when we eat our first meal of the day closer to noon after getting up perhaps five, six hours earlier, we put our clocks out of sync, the, the clocks in our organs versus the central circadian clock in our brain. And you get all the problems of the cycles being out of sync. It can be completely reversed by just eating earlier in the day. And I'm not saying you need to eat a huge meal earlier in the day, but you need to eat earlier in the day. You need to eat something. It's important to keep these clocks in sync. Now, one thing that happens for older folks is your LDL cholesterol will drop just by doing that. But there's many other benefits. It'll, it'll help prevent premature aging and uh, mood disorders and obesity. Uh, I've read many articles about eating soon after waking up, but they never explain why you should eat soon after getting out of bed, rising, you know, getting your clothes on. Why are you supposed to eat so early? Well, this is the reason. It's to link your circadian clock with the other clocks in your organs um, so that your body is starting in sync. All right, so that's what I had for today's topic. I'm going, going to go off lecture mode in just a moment. One other thing I wanted to mention was my trip to Pennsylvania uh, doing blood screenings. I've got, I believe, seven openings left. So if anyone is interested, uh, please contact me, phone, text, or email, and uh, secure your appointment. At this point, it will be May 29th. And 30th, I believe that's a Friday and a Saturday. Okay, uh, so now I'm going to go off lecture mode. So are there any questions for this evening's call? I have one concerning what you were just um, speaking about, about yes. not waiting too long to eat in the morning. Yes, yes. <clears throat> yes. What, what is happening for me when, when my brain feels better and better? I just, overall, I feel better if I wait to eat till toward lunchtime. What, what's going wrong with that? It, it, you're eating the wrong foods. So, for instance, one of the absolute best things we should do first thing in the morning is to have a glass of warm water with about half or, or a quarter or a third of a lemon squeezed into the warm water. Another thing we really should be doing first thing in the morning and then waiting all the way to lunch is to have fresh squeezed celery juice. This has incredible health benefits for every organ in your body. Um, so that's what I would recommend you do. You're going to still feel hungry um, if you're not eating breakfast, or at least you're going to feel better when you do eat at lunchtime. So when I say to eat, I'm not necessarily referring to having bacon and eggs and toast, because a lot of people can't eat and don't feel like eating a lot when they get up, meaning, say, within 30 or 45 minutes of getting out of bed. But you really should consume uh, lemon water, uh, preferably with a capsule of turmeric, and then perhaps a half hour after that, some freshly squeezed celery juice. This is the optimum way to start your day and there's no uh, solid food. This is all liquid. Okay. 
and you'll notice tremendous benefits in every organ in your body, uh, all the way all the way through your brain, and you'll get much better numbers when you get a standard blood test. You'll have much better cholesterol. You'll detox. Your liver will be a lot healthier, and that's really the organ that gets destroyed in all of us because the liver has to get rid of and break down, decompose all the toxins that we breathe and eat and drink. So starting the day with an opportunity for the liver to clean up is so important. Okay. So I have been doing the lemon juice with the turmeric and steroids. Right. And then I've been doing my wheatgrass juice powder in capsules. Right yeah. Along so, with that. so all Should that's I be good. Waiting a little while, like a half an hour in between. Yes. I, just take, I take it all at the same time. Right. <laughs> so the latest evidence is to wait about 30 minutes between the lemon, warm lemon water and turmeric capsule and your juice. The optimum is celery juice, but yeah. um, and I used to not be a big proponent or advocate of juicing because I I like the smoothies and and all the fiber and nutrition, but the celery juice is not about having a meal; it's about health. It, it's about cleansing organs and uh, continuously detoxing and preparing the body for the next meal, which would be later in the day or later in the morning, um, that would contain fat and and protein, carbs, and fat, meaning you get back to your normal meal schedule. Okay. So then maybe the only thing that I need to change is just put um, about a half an hour between I'll do lemon juice and turmeric and sterile max and then wait half an hour and do my wheatgrass cap. I mean, it's been working so well for me that I'm not quite ready to to lay that aside. But actually, you're doing the right thing. So when I miss my my wheatgrass, (laughs) when when I miss it for some reason, I get terribly, terribly hungry and I can hardly make it. You know, until right. I almost start feeling weak. But right. I think that the wheatgrass must be giving me something that that my body desperately needs because it um, curbs my hunger and my brain feels better and better and better the longer I go without eating anything else than besides all that. Yeah, you have the right habit. Okay. So you're already doing what I was recommending. Okay. I just <laughs> I thought it was... Um, uh, thinking that you were meaning that we have to eat some other kind of food um, earlier right. in the day, and I yeah, was, I actually didn't go into when I was talking earlier about what to have. So I'm glad you asked that question because um, a lot of people think what I mean is to have you know bacon and eggs and et cetera. Um, that's not the best way to start your day. Um, something that I do is I absolutely start with the warm lemon water and turmeric. Then 30 minutes later, I have about six or more ounces of freshly squeezed celery juice. And then an hour or two later, I have oatmeal with fruit. I still haven't had any fat until closer to lunchtime. Okay. And and that's absolutely the best way to keep your liver and your gallbladder and your gastrointestinal system at peak performance. And you'll end up with a lot of energy. Thank, thank you for explaining. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so I'll close out the call, and I'll be doing, do you have another one? Yeah, I do have a couple more if you have time. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Um, 
I just recently <coughs> got some blood work done, some lab work through my local doctor, and if you would rather if I call you um, um, later, I can I can do that. Does, does it matter if I'm um, asking a lot of questions about my blood work <laughs> right now? Uh, it'll probably be a little personal, so go ahead and call me after I end the conference call. Okay. One of the Give me about 10 minutes and I'll, uh, I'll be able to pick up. One of the questions was about um, the silver. Um, she saw that my hemoglobin and my hematocrit, um, yeah. the ratio between them would be pointing towards um, Babesia, one of the co- a co-infection, in addition to my Lyme issues. And I thought that um, silver would um, be targeting that kind of thing too, or am I wrong? Does does the silver touch the parasites that are already in your blood? It does. It does, yes. Yes. There may be an issue with your probiotic content right now, because you can't take probiotics when you do take silver. And this is always a challenge uh, with long-term colloidal silver induction into the body, right? Uh, I actually have not gotten started yet on the silver because I'm still trying to work up on my probiotics. Okay. So I remember you're very sensitive to... uh, yeah, you she, start off. She, you have to start off everything slowly, right? Yeah, she said that um, because Babesia is a malaria-like parasite, that silver will not touch it. She said she gives me. Um, she spread her fingers apart as a teeny little bit. She said, "I'll, I'll, I'll give this much space to be wrong." <laughs> uh, it does kill it. It depends on the particle size of the colloidal silver. So. Yeah. Most colloidal silvers are not ionic, which means essentially atomic particle size. They're clusters. They're very large clusters of hundreds of silver atoms clumped together. And, yeah, they won't have enough activity. But ionized silver will. Okay. I want to give her some information about your silver she would like to read. And... um she obviously, you know, is not understanding all the yeah. information behind some of the products that I am using from you. Yeah. yeah. So I believe that information is on the Enriching Gifts website. When you click on the product, there's a there's a video and there's a, a nice description of the silver. Is it better than your little um, paper that you share, the little fold or the little brochure? They're similar, very okay. similar, yeah. Okay. I mean, they're written, they're, they're both writ, written by uh, Ron Schneider. So mm-hmm. the only thing I add to that is just a little more chemistry background on uh, particle size distribution and activity of ions versus clusters. And what should I tell her to look up again? What was the site? Uh, Enrichinggifts.com. Okay. So that has all the information on the products. Okay. And then if there's questions, have her call me directly. But she's the one that said that if if, um, I improve doing the things under you, that she will call you personally. <laughs> and I don't think she has, um, I think she's still waiting to see what's going to happen with me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I remember because your, your situation is unique, the way your body responds to external stimuli, right? Every food you eat, every yeah. uh, supplement you consume. Some of those things have improved a lot since I'm doing the Sterile Max. Right. Right. And then I have some um, hormonal questions um, concerning thyroid issues and estrogen, progesterone, things like that. So So I will mention to everyone, I 
I made a few videos. Uh, one of them is on thyroid and how to heal your thyroid without spending any money, without buying anything. And uh, there's another video coming out on probiotics versus prebiotics and linked to the newsletter that's coming out uh, will be a YouTube video on the first three breathing techniques, phase one, two, and three. So in answer to your question about the thyroid, um, I could just send you that video early, you know, before it's uh, before it's on YouTube. But I can just talk to you about it. I don't have a computer, so. Oh, okay, that's right. I wouldn't be able to get that. Yeah. Then um, she also well, let me just mention that then on the call um, with, with the thyroid. The thyroid wants iodine. And iodine is in the same family of elements as fluorine, chlorine, and bromine. So they have similar chemical properties. All we need to do to heal our own thyroid is to prevent fluorine, chlorine, and bromine from getting into the body. So here's what you do. For fluorine, you only use a fluorine-free toothpaste. And... If you're using city water, you would have a simple fluorine uh, filter or chlorine filter on your shower head because these elements do enter the skin like water through a sponge. So, but the main, main issue with fluorine is municipal water and toothpaste. The chlorine gets into our bodies as a cleaning agent. So it's the main component of bleach and comet and many other cleaning products. So you just switch to chlorine-free cleaning products and there's a substitute for everything. There's a chlorine-free cleaner that's similar to bleach, but it won't have chlorine. They will not be as effective at killing bacteria, but they'll save your thyroid. The bromine is introduced into our food supply as a whitening agent for food. So this is what makes rice white, sugar white, and flour white. So the simple way to do the substitution so you're not taking in bromine is if you're going to use sugar, you would use raw sugar. You'll notice it's brown, not white. If you're using wheat, you're gonna use whole grain wheat instead of white flour. So whole grain flour made from whole grain wheat um, instead of white flour. And let's see, what was the other one? Uh, sugar, well, rice. So you would use brown or whole grain wild rice instead of white rice. And that will eliminate the introduction of bromine into the body. Now, when you do all of that, now you have a chance to heal your thyroid. So now you give your thyroid what it wants, which is iodine. And you can supplement with iodine. You can get it for virtually nothing if you buy Morton iodized salt. Unfortunately, Himalayan sea salt does not contain iodine. Uh, you would think based on its name it would because iodine is in the sea, but uh, Himalayan sea salt is quite a good source of minerals, but not iodine. There's no iodine in it. So a lot of people think they're feeding their thyroid with iodine when they take in Himalayan sea salt, and actually there isn't any. So that's basically what's in a a video that will be coming out soon. So I actually take iodine pills to yeah. try to get more than what right. you would get in other ways. Right. And in the past year, uh, let me think, how long ago did I do? I think it might be a year or a little. I'm not sure when it was that I started taking iodine pills, but my TSH um, is higher than what it used to be. It's the first time in my life that my TSH has ever shown a problem, 
even though I've had thyroid symptoms for years and years and years. It's the first time that my TSH actually shows a problem. And it went from 1.16 to 4.42. Okay. In one year's time. She usually does blood work a little more often, but um, it got overdue because of some factors on my end of, of the story. And so okay. I have some options to do, and I'm not sure that I like any of them. <laughs> right. She suggested synthetic um, T4 and more nature throid. I'm already doing some nature throid, but I'm not yeah. at the level that she wanted me to be doing because every time that I tried to increase nature throid, I lost more hair than ever before. Okay, so it went the other way. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually hurting you rather yeah. than helping you. And so I refused to go up on the nature throid because of of my hair issues. And I'm scared to do synthetic T4 because I, I just, it feels like I'm going in the wrong direction to to supplement in that way. Right. But my my TSH is higher. I'm more hypo than, than what I used to be. Yeah. And do you do you have any theories about why that would be? My only theory is somehow fluorine, chlorine, or bromine is getting into your body. It's either going through your skin, like through a swimming pool or a hot tub um, or a, a shower head, or or you're you're consuming white food somehow whether it be sugar, rice, or flour. I and you're very sensitive <laughs> to fluorine, chlorine, and bromine. Yeah. And, I've been and so trying. you'll have to go cold turkey. I, I've been trying. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite to perfection, I suppose, but it's, it's probably better now than what it has ever been in my life. <laughs> yeah. And yet, I'm worse. Yeah, I... My numbers. I mean, that's, that's the basic science behind the thyroid functioning. So, I, I don't have anything else. I wish I did. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll try to um, think here if if it's slipping in somehow, some way that I'm not knowing. Yeah. If I run across anything in the next few days, I will contact you and let you know. Or even if I think of something um, you know, in the next day or two, I will let you know. There was one question that she had about my turmeric. Um, She asked me if I'm taking coconut oil with it. And I said, no, that... You don't want to in the morning, no. That's a mistake. That I do the sterile max and the lemon water and the turmeric all together. Yeah. And she said everything that she's been reading everywhere, it's just very, very important to be taking coconut oil for the absorption of the turmeric no the opposite it'll yeah i don't know where she's getting her information but i don't either she wanted me to ask you yeah i I sort of disagreed with her because i never heard you saying anything about it and she she said well you you asking she said i I, (laughs) yeah you don't want to take in fats first thing in the morning right absolutely not no fat because it'll it'll disrupt the liver's ability to metabolize sugars and make glycogen and to detox and cleanse itself. It, it will serve the opposite effect. It will stress the liver instead of heal the liver. Okay. And maybe she didn't understand that I was doing this at the beginning of the day. I mean, if she thought I was taking my turmeric, you know, some other time in the day yeah. or something. Yeah. 
All right, then I'll keep on doing the way I've been doing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, what you're doing is optimum. I mean, the only way to make it better would be just to have a celery juice, too, if you may, maybe even cycled it between the days you're doing wheatgrass. But you're going to get a benefit from wheatgrass juice also. So and is your celery um, organic? Or yes. It has to be organic. Like yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's the juice, no water. Uh, no fiber. So this is a somewhat of a unique situation with me telling people to juice because normally I don't. And how much do you do? It'll be, you're, you're going to end up juicing about five or six stalks in the morning. Okay. About that. It, it'll it'll come out to about four to six ounces, something like that. And if you don't have a juicer, um, is there any way to do it and like drink yes. it? Or? Yes, there's a way to do it. So what? Another thing you can do. This is your uh, substitute for a juicer. Is you would use a blender and then strain it. So you can strain it through just a regular strainer, and uh, it, it won't be efficient, but it'll do the job. When I say efficient, meaning what's left behind will still be wet, and with a juicer, what's left behind will be dry. So you just have a very efficient extraction of the celery juice, but it will still get the job done, a blender and a strainer. If I go ahead and ask the estrogen progesterone question yet, then I don't think I will need to call you later. <laughs> yeah. <me> to do. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Now? Okay. Yeah. So it, she said that it's a good ratio, but it's too low. Oh, and the total is low. Yeah, the, the yeah. ratio between estrogen and progesterone. No, she did like the estradiol. Um, yes. That number and the progesterone number are both low. Yeah. And she would like to to boost the estrogen and that I would take more of the progesterone that I'm already taking. And she thought maybe that could help to improve the thyroid situation too. But and that's possible, yeah. So what – this is a dilemma because the way to make more progesterone and estrogen – is to consume or consume more cholesterol or have the liver make more cholesterol. And normally that's a bad thing, but you still need cholesterol to make these hormones and you know in, including testosterone. So it's a bit of a dilemma you're in because you could consume uh, later in the day um, meat or eggs that be with the yolk, and I normally I would not recommend that, but that's how you make these hormones. Okay. Now most of the cholesterol in our body is made by the liver, so the other way to make more estrogen and progesterone would be just to have your liver functioning ideally. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like you eat pretty well already. Well, I'm sure it's not perfect because it's, um, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. But, I, I but have... that's the dilemma is to potentially – not necessarily recommending this, but there's this possibility that you're one of the 1% people out there that needs to consume animal products 
eggs and meat and dairy, normally things that would hinder the health of the body. And, and everything's a trade-off in your case between general health and hormone production. That's what makes physical health so difficult. It's, it's different for everyone. Sometimes it's based on blood type, based on age, based on genetics. So you have to figure out what works for you at this point in your life. So I'm just throwing out there that there is this possibility you need more cholesterol. I thought I do get a fair amount of animal product like um, meat and eggs and things like that, but I suppose I could try to get more and see what happens. Now, if you are consuming them, then do the opposite, meaning your liver might be stressed from these uh, foods, and if you were to consume less, then your liver would function more properly. So instead of adding, start taking away okay. and see what, how your liver responds. All right. And then I get protein through other beans, sources? Beans and whole grain rice which would be, you know, and any wild rice or any quinoa rice. And then any kind of bean and any kind of pea. And then just spice them up so they taste good. You get used to it really fast. And the health benefits will make you want to keep coming. Okay, well, I think I like those options a little better than um, pouring more um, prescriptions into my body. Right, right. At some point, um, prescriptions are necessary. Uh, it's rare. It's very rare that a person needs prescriptions, but it, but it does happen. Most of the time, we can do everything with food and maybe with some supplements along the way to make sure we digest the food and keep our white cells active and, and keep the parasites down with probiotics. But most everything else we can do with food. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so now I'm going to... Yeah. Uh -uh. Hey, next week maybe could you address the lymph system, the lymph nodes yes. and the lymph system? Okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. We'll talk about lymph next week. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Great, great. Thanks for mentioning that. We'll have that as our topic next week. All right, so I'm going to close out the call, and uh, next week we'll be talking about lymph. So uh, thanks for listening. And uh, stay healthy. Good night, everybody.